That would help too. My name is Bobby Wygant. It's I'm nice from to meet you. Dallas, Fort Worth, and I did an right. interview with you once before at the Sheraton Universal. I remember that. Day. That was yeah. about four years ago with that awful show I did at NBC. Stand by. <laughs> but I must say, nothing changed in your life as a result of that. <laughs> no, that's right, McLean students, and I am still gainfully employed, I hope. A and at very least attractive. I was until we started this. And working <laughs> at a station, WFAA TV? Oh, no. Wrong. Oh. KXAS TV. Well, isn't WFAA TV in Dallas? Yes, but it's the A TV of WFAA. Oh, let's start this all over. That's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> No, I think that's kind of funny. No, I and I also <laughs> said shit. Oh, we got to start it all over. Yeah, start over. <laughs> no, I, that it used to be the NBC affiliate. No, oh, and and radio, honey, radio. They were never NBC for <laughs> They do. They used to carry the Today oh, Show. when this we is, used to split. That's a whole other. It's on Henry Hines Boulevard. There. I worked there. I was. Oh. I played Billy Goat and Mr. <laughs> Ed and Billy Goat. I was a, worked with a 55-year-old alcohol and alcoholic, and I came out with a goat suit on. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> all I'm right. sorry. <laughs> Well, here's this former goat. <laughs> oh, had to bring it up, didn't you? What is this? You worked in Dallas and you were a goat? Yes, a long time ago, 1954 to be exact. Notice, too, how well my clothes fit to give you some idea how my career is going. Now, if I unbutton this, not only will you see the pot belly, but it'll look like I'll need a training bra because the jacket gets this kind of action going for it. But to answer your question, back in 1953, at uh, one of your competitors in the Dallas area, uh, there was a kid's show, um, and it was uh, Captain Mac and Billy Goat. I played Billy Goat. Captain Mac was played by a, a gentleman who was, at that time, in his late 50s, and uh, had what you'd call, I think, a basic drinking problem, and that he was into about five quarts a day between the time he got up and the time we went on at nine. <laughs> And uh, generally come in with a cheeseburger hanging out of his mouth and a lady whose name he didn't know. And uh, we'd have these little toddlers. And it was uh, either that or romper room. That was what they had to choose in those days. Watching a drunk old man and a skinny guy sweat a lot in a goat suit. <laughs> and um, I never will forget it. Uh, made some dear, dear friends down there, none of whom are uh, connected with that station any longer. But uh, to give you some idea of what kind of luck I have, I. I'm very lucky when it comes to working. In other areas, once I get the job, I'm, I swear to God, if I bought a pumpkin farm, they'd declare Halloween no longer a holiday. <laughs> um, but I did, uh, at the one time before the Dallas Cowboys became what they are today, there was an American football conference, okay, not to be confused with the American Football League. And Dallas was to have a team, and they played out in the Henry Hines Stadium. I don't know if you're familiar with that or where that is. Harry Hines. Harry Hines. What did yeah. I say, Henry? Henry. Oh, I thought he changed his name. <laughs> well, in any event, Harry Hines. Everything was named Harry Hines. Who was Harry Hines? I have no idea. Like Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> Everything is Crump, and nobody knows who you're talking about. Crump Stadium, Crump this, Crump that. Anyway, it was Hines Stadium. Held about 14,000 people if they all stood still, because it was a very iffy building. Um, Buddy Young, who had played, I think, uh, at the University of Illinois and had a tremendous uh, pro record, played with about 22 pro teams, was the youngest guy on this ball club. I mean, this was your basic guys with no necks, pointed ears, and the IQ of houseplants, <laughs> with suits that didn't quite match and tennis shoes, out there playing the likes of, uh, at that time, the Cleveland Rams. I got the lucky job of be doing the color sports color. So I gave up the billy goat suit and went into sports casting, doing the color on these games. We were down there, uh, we played one game, okay? Uh, there were about 14 people in the stand. At the half, the sponsors that had the remaining of the half walked out, said we will not pay for our port portion of the telecast no matter what you say. Uh, I lost a job and the team moved from Dallas, went to New York. It tells you something. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was my uh, sportscasting uh, background. Well, Had now a news you're job in Memphis once that lasted about ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Filled in for a guy on the Sunday night eleven o'clock late news. No kidding. Wrap up. This is it. With a dippy lady that had a cooking show five mornings a week and wanted to take a crack at newscasting on the weekends because things weren't going too well for at home. Mm -hmm. And it was right during the Korean War. 
between this lady and myself not being able to pronounce any of those phonetic things they give you on those yellow sheets of paper like Pan Moon John, and I said news instead of news, the guy actually fired me on the air. We went to a commercial. I'll never forget her. She said, we'll be right back after this commercial message and over the PA system. You'll be back. He's gone. <laughs> and I was gone. There was an empty chair there for the next 20 minutes. I never, and the guy said, no, get in the truck, man. Keep moving. Because you ain't ever done the news. I went in there with a big phony resume and a glossy 8 by 10 So then I decided I'd be an actor and I went to New York. And you know, if we don't say hello, Larry, at least 10 times before this interview concludes, we're both going to be on a truck going north to someplace. Well, that's the show that I'm doing for NBC. And uh, I think people are going to like it. Uh, I'm comfortable, really, for the first time since MASH in the role that I'm playing. It's a story of a guy who's uh, divorced, has the custody of his two teenage children, and is a radio talk show host. And so far we're talking about my life story. And so therefore it's, very, it's a very easy role to play. It's well written. Norman Lear um, is in charge of our production. and. Freddie Silverman, your erstwhile leader, for those of you folks out there that aren't reading the trades or know who he is, uh, he's the head of NBC now, picked me for this part. So, and I think I trust his judgment because he picks me for Henry Blake in MASH and he picked me for Doris Day's boss and he was right those two times. So um, I'm very happy and I hope people enjoy it. I think we're on at what, 8.30 Friday night? Oh, we'll look that up and tell them later. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm not sure. Well, all right, but don't keep it a surprise <laughs> too long. I need the money. <laughs> Mac, I hope this is a, really, I do hope this is a terrific hit for you. Thank you. Because uh, you deserve it. You're a funny guy, and I don't think that in recent years they've really captured you. I think way. they have here. You know where Arlington is? Oh, of course. Could I just say one thing about it? Sure. One of my best buddies down there with uh, Bell Aircraft, Bubba Johnson, you borrowed $5 from me in 1949, and you ain't ever paid it back. So if Mrs. Johnson's watching, would you have Bubba send the money to me here in California? <laughs> thank you. <Sure>. Hello, Larry. <laughs> Matt, thank you. So You're welcome. Much. That's true. <laughs> Bubba never paid me that ten dollars back. Shame the on big Bubba. executive down there. <laughs> <laughs> My son of a bitch borrowed ten dollars <laughs> in 1949. And no kidding. We were at, we were at a dance. A bunch of us, like eight guys, and. Uh, you know, you get eight guys in a quart of beer and you drive around to 37 Plymouth and yell at girls and uh, act like you're drunk and stuff. And so Bubba says, give me $10. And I said, okay, you pay it back, won't you? Sure. Now, you know when you somebody borrows money from you, hey, you feel like a fool going up and asking them for it. Well, now it's 49, 59, <laughs> 69, 49. And I'm getting Christmas cards from him and those letters that tell you about how the family is. You know, he writes one of those five-page letters about the girls and I've had my teeth capped and uh, <laughs> Joanna's just having her hairstyle and we bought a new station wagon and all that stuff. And I keep sending back, send me my ten dollars. Man, I don't want to care about the family and what you're doing. I just want my ten dollars. Listen, do you know where he lives in Arlington? Because I He's the vice president of Bell Aircraft. Okay, I'll find out. Okay. He's the number one. Well, I'll right put here on TV. Hmm? Right here on TV5. Okay. Yeah, I didn't have to hold it that close. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it in 10 seconds? Yeah. Just know you're nuts because you were going to punch the watch. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Stop giggling. This tape's expensive. Hello, I'm McLean Stevenson inviting you to watch Hello, Larry, right here on TV5.